All right, continuing on from the last video, uh, we were talking about the requirements for the binomial uh, distribution. And one of those requirements is that the trials be independent with a constant probability. Uh, an example that I gave you was with these lottery uh, balls. And I want you to keep in mind that one way to ensure that you have uh, constant probabilities on each trial is when one of these balls comes out, just put it back in before the next ball comes out and then put that one back before the next ball comes out. Think about it. Um, without replacement, when this, if they say there's 100 balls in here, so when this 12 comes out, now there's 99. So the probability of getting the first ball is 1 out of 100, but the probability of getting the second ball is 1 out of 99. The probability is changing on the second trial. Then it'd be one out of 98 for the third ball, so on and so forth. But if when that ball comes out, that first one, uh, you record it as, okay, 12 came out, and then you put it back, well, the probability of pulling the next ball is one out of 100. And then this ball comes out, and you note it, that it was a five that came out, and um, then put it back. And the probability of the next ball is one in a hundred. So as long as you're replacing the balls as you um, do the trials, then you're going to get the same probabilities on each trial. So that's why we say a sample that's taken with replacement will have constant probabilities, and therefore the trials will be independent of each other. In the social sciences, we're not dealing with lottery balls, we're dealing with people. But it's the same principle. You're taking people out of the larger population. So the, the globe of balls represents the, the population of people. And then when you create a sample, you're pulling out a, a fraction of those. And if you want to achieve independence across trials and constant probability, you would use replacement or you would use a very large population. And you can see that uh, if you go back to the ball example. Um, let's say that it's not 100 balls in here. Let's say it's uh, 10,000 balls. Well, yes, when that first ball comes out, um, the probability of it coming out is 1 out of 10,000. Um, and then now that that's out of there, the probability of the second ball is 1 out of 9,999. Because that's such a small change, we may say it's mathematically insignificant and it would not affect the credibility of our research. Therefore, we might actually be able to use the binomial distribution and assume independence and constant probability anytime we pull a sample that is from a very large population. That's what researchers are typically doing, right? They're pulling a sample of 30 or 100 or maybe 1,000, but it's out of a population of millions of people. Okay, now let's practice with some Excel examples. And the first question says 20% of males in the population suffer from some form of color blindness. You randomly select six males. We're going to select the, or we're going to create a probability distribution in Excel to illustrate this. So the first thing you're going to do in Excel is set up your columns. And uh, you want to identify the discrete outcomes that could occur. If you're evaluating the probability of getting someone that is colorblind and you have a randomly selected six males, then you need to think in terms of you could have zero, right? Zero of those six have colorblindness. One, two, three, four, five, or six. So the first column is setting up your discrete values. Then the next column, what we're going to do is actually go to Excel and find the binomial formula. Just type in binome, use the simplest one, binome.dist, and then it's going to ask you for some things. For number underscore s, that's going to be the number of uh, successes, and that's actually represented by your column. Okay, zero successes, one success, two, three, four, five, or six. So we're going to populate A1 to represent that part of our formula. And then trials is just the number of, uh, of males, six. That's your N, right? You're looking at six males, N is six. The probability of a success, it's given to us, it's 20%. So we're going to put 0.2. 
and then cumulative, uh, we're going to put zero because we don't want a cumulative distribution. We want a non-cumulative. Then we click on OK, and it gives us a number. Now, I always recommend rounding these for simplicity, and then we can just drag this down. And you'll notice it tells us very quickly, very easily, the probability of getting different uh, values. So, for example, the probability of getting zero uh, males that are colorblind, if you randomly select six from the population, is 26%. Probability of getting one is 39%. Probability of getting two is 25%, so on and, and so forth. It says, based on the results, what is the probability that exactly four of them suffer from color blindness? And we go to four, and it's pretty clear it's two, right? Probability that exactly four suffer from some form of color blindness is 2%. Then it asks us, what is the probability of one or less suffering uh, some form of color blindness? Well, one or less means zero or one, so we can just add these two together. So I can put the sum here for equals this plus this. Try to do it in your head, but it's 66%. Okay. Now there is another way to do this. If we wanted to use the cumulative function, we can go back to here, pull up our formula box, and change this to 1. Watch what happens. Now when we drag this down, it actually gives us 66 because the cumulative distribution is saying the probability of any discrete value up to that point. So the cumulative distribution for 1 is telling us the probability of getting a 0 or a 1. The last question here says, is the binomial distribution the appropriate model to use in answering this question? In order to determine if it's the appropriate model, think back to the prerequisites for the binomial distribution. The first prerequisite was we needed two outcomes, success or failure. Well, that's true, because if 20% of males suffer from colorblindness, that means 80% don't. They're mutually exclusive categories. You can't be colorblind and not be colorblind, and they're collectively exhausted. You're either one or the other, and the probability of successes and failures sum to one. So yes, it meets the first criteria of the binomial distribution. The second criteria is we have a fixed n, and we do because we have clearly selected six males, n equals six, that's our sample. And the third criteria is that we have uh, independence and constant probability. Independence meaning each trial uh, is not affecting the probability of subsequent trials. Is that the case? Well, we're pulling from the larger population of people six males. So it's such a small fraction in our sample relative to the larger population that if there were any changes in probabilities, they would be mathematically insignificant. Now, if I had said we're pulling six males from a population of 15, you would say, no, that, that, that's going to be um, a problem because the probabilities would change too dramatically when you create that sample and pull out each male. So you couldn't use the binomial under those conditions. Uh, but in this case, because we're pulling from the larger population, we can use the binomial. Okay, let's go on to the next question. It says, 40% of school of the school's population is female, and the entire school has 30 students. You randomly select students to attend a lecture on industrial statistics. So we're going to use the same process here. Uh, our first column is going to be the discrete outcomes that could occur. So if we're pulling a sample of 10 students from a population of 30 students, then we might want to figure out, well, what is the probability of getting a female? So we could get in those 10 students, zero females. We get one student, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or 10. Right? Those are all the discrete possibilities that could occur. Right? Then we use the same process. We take the function formula here and we choose binomial distribution okay? and our number of successes well the number of successes is going to be that first column and okay? so we'll select a1 trials uh, there's 10 right n equals 10 our sample size is 10 the probability of a success it gave it to us it's it's 40 percent 
approximately 40% of the school's population is female, so 0.4. And then again, we'll start out without cumulative. Click on OK, and we've got the percentages here. Let me pull this up a little bit and drag this down, and voila. And the probability of getting zero females is 1%. The probability of getting five females is 20%, that kind of thing. Um, so we created the probability distribution. Now it says, based on the results, what is the probability that exactly six of them are female? Okay, well, let's take a look. Probability that exactly six are female is 11%. Now, what is the probability that uh, more than six are female? Well, if you look at our results here, that would be 7, 8, and 9, and 10. We just add these up, so the probability would be 5%. And then the last question for this one is if the binomial was appropriate. Well, we go back to our three criterion for the binomial. The first is, do we have success and failure? Um, female versus male, typically thought of as success or failure. So it meets that criteria. The second criteria is, do we have a fixed number of trials? Well, we do, because we pulled 10 students in our sample, uh, so n equals 10. And then the third criterion is, do we have constant probabilities and independence across trials? This one is not going to be met. Why? Because notice we pulled 10 students, not out of a million, but out of 30 students. So that those students, as you pull them out, you're changing the probabilities too significantly uh, to use the binomial. We fail the third criteria of independence across trials and constant probability. So the binomial is actually not the appropriate uh, probability distribution to use here. Um, what you would use is what's called the hypogeometric, which is not something we study in this class because normally we're not dealing with pulling a sample of 10 people out of 30. But in the event you were doing that, you would need to use a different type of distribution. The last bullet here says, uh, using Excel, construct a histogram for the two probability distributions above. And then we'll look at the shape of the histogram and play around with the probabilities to see how it changes. Going back to the first example with the color blindness, to construct a histogram, we're just going to scroll over our data, go up here to insert, click on the um, different options, and let's go ahead and select the clustered column, and then we're going to get rid of the blue bars here. And you'll notice that it gives us uh, the percentages that we built, so 26%, right, and then 39%, that kind of thing. And again, I, I tend to prefer to clean these up a little bit, uh, but we can get rid of the data here. Uh, we can put maybe color blindness. color blindness among the population. And remember, for the histogram, you've got to get rid of these gaps. Okay? And there we go. Now, you'll also notice that it defaults to 1. We do need to change that. So to do such, we're going to go up here to Select Data, and we're going to click on Edit, and we're going to actually reselect this column here. Click OK. And notice now it goes to 0. All right, so that's how we would create a histogram given, let's clean this up a little bit, a histogram um, given our uh, data. Let's do the same thing now for the second question. And same process, we're gonna scroll over the data. We're gonna click Insert. We're gonna go to Column, get rid of the blue bars. Um, clean this up a little bit here. Okay. And this is gonna be, uh, females, okay, and then click on here, double click here, get rid of the gaps, and same issue, we need to select our data, let's see here, go up here to select data, edit, and scroll over here so we get that zero in there, and that's it. Yeah. All right, guys, uh, I will pick up with the remainder of this section in the next video. Thanks.